good evening everyone welcome to this session of um, astro adda a series of um, popular astronomy talks uh, organized by nehru planetarium nehru memorial museum and library and public outreach and education committee astronomical society of india and we are moving towards gravitational waves i think for the first time and uh, we, are, we are really so fortunate to have with us professor uh, tarun soradeep who uh, is uh, uh, leading um, one, one of the leading figures in india's steps towards gravitational wave um, endeavors and also um, part of the very first paper wherein gravitational waves were detected in a way i mean revolutionizing Uh, the way we are looking at uh, the kind of multi messenger kind of astronomy possibilities that we are having and um, and professor tarun saradeep from uh, iser um, pune and also from ayuka and i think also you were there at tifr in several places and he has um, many many awards to his credit including breakthrough for the very first the gravitational wave detection people tarun uh, i will uh, hand over to you and uh, uh, when you ask me i will put your um, um, screen share on and uh, this is to all the speaker all the participants viewers that uh, uh, tarun would not be able to see your questions if you put out put out your question I already see many comments perhaps there are some questions coming in and so just be aware that questions will be answered towards the end i'll hand over to you tarun Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ratna Shri, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to young people about some exciting uh, science goals that one can have in gravitation cosmology. So today, I chose to talk about a slightly more futuristic uh, quest that I hope we will be on in a decade from now, and that is uh, the quest for cosmic origin. okay and that involves interestingly two areas of uh, uh, astronomy and astrophysics that uh, i am very familiar with uh, both at gravitation cosmology so it has gravitational waves and the cosmic micro background which is one of the most uh, important uh, observables that we have to understand our universe okay so let me begin my talk so uh, i'll be talking about the quest for cosmic origin and before i uh, uh, let me show you that the cosmos is very uh, pretty and here's a picture uh, courtesy uh, doje anchuk who is an astronomer at the lay observatory indian astronomical observatory in lay uh, of the entire milky way but the milky way is just our own galaxy if you know it's a uh, just our how home in the cosmological sense before going to this quest let me spend a little minute uh, since i am the spokesperson of ligo india to mention that uh, uh, underway now is a, an interesting an exciting quest that india is already part of which is ligo india we are building one of the gravitational wave observatories on indian soil in a uh, uh, little town called onda in uh, hingoli district of maharashtra uh, the closest big city you may know be aware of is nanded uh, which is about 60 kilometers away and we have acquired the site and we are in the construction phase and one of the buildings is already Uh, you know sort of coming up and uh, so let me now last few years i have been sort of focusing my uh, thoughts more on the next uh, big quest we could be getting into and that is the quest i'll be talking about and this is a quest in cosmology and it is also the quest to understand the origin of the universe okay so it's a very prized quest and interestingly it involves gravitational waves but we'll get to that so then let me tell you a bit about the universe uh, while we get to that before we get to that 
So uh, at this point, there are uh, there is one window which is open uh, to the gravitational waves in gravitational waves uh, to the universe. So we can see the universe in gravitational waves observed by these LIGO detectors, which started in 2016. By now, we have many, many sources uh, of uh, detected, uh, many, many uh, instances of mergers of black holes and neutron stars. And very exciting science and astronomy is coming out of it. But of course, uh, and LIGO India will add a huge thing to it by allowing astronomy with it, gravitational wave astronomy. So that's one window, but there are other windows. One is a space-based uh, gravitational wave detector called LISA, which is expected to come up somewhere in the mid-30s, uh, 2030s, which will detect sources of a similar kind. I should mention the LIGO detects sources of time periods of milliseconds. And these are also relatively close by in cosmological sense. But LISA will detect uh, black hole mergers, which are you know the big, massive, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. And those sources will revolutionize our understanding. Uh, and black hole mergers, as well as black holes falling into such super black, massive black holes and other sources. Then there's pulsar timing array, which uh, can open up any time now. In fact, last week at the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting, there were tantalizing hints that there may be already signal uh, present in the current data of the pulsar timing array. But I will be focusing on this window. And uh, this, uh, there's a question mark as to when it will open. But actually, we, technically, we are very close in technologically. Uh, uh, we are very close to measuring gravitational wave, uh, which originated at the beginning of the universe. OK, and this is in the cosmic microwave background. And in fact, in the linear polarization pattern of the microwave background. And these gravitational wave, uh, when detected, will be unique from the other three because these have a quantum origin. They originate in quantum theory uh, applied to uh, you know, curved universe, curved space time. And uh, so these would be exciting step towards uh, understanding uh, quantization of gravity. And you know, it's, it's going to be a fundamental breakthrough. So let's go back and talk about the universe itself. So the universe, as I told you in the first picture, is very beautiful. But what we really appreciate from Earth uh, looking out with naked eye is essentially the Milky Way. Largely, you will go to a very nice uh, dark place with clear skies. And this is you know, a beautiful picture reflected in the lake. And you can see there's lots of stars. But these are all of our uh, from our own galaxy. If you move off the galactic plane to somewhere here and uh, choose some dark spot where you don't see any of our foreground stars and zoom in with the most powerful telescopes we have, and everyone must have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is what is called an ultra deep field image of a small part of the sky, tiny part of the sky. And you can see that there are literally thousands upon thousands of galaxies and stretching far away, so far that light traveling from those galaxies originated when the galaxies were themselves forming. So some of the splotches that you see, uh, which don't look like typical galaxies, are actually galaxies, but they are not formed yet properly. They are kind of just forming. And every little splotch here is actually a galaxy. So the universe is full of galaxies. And we really need to understand the you know structure of the universe, uh, how what is uh, there in the universe. And if also, we would like to understand where did it all begin, right? And how did it all begin? 
and that's the quest and one of the most uh, you know uh, kind of prized quests of uh, mankind is to understand our own origin uh, the origin of the universe we are inherited so to do cosmology uh, we actually treat a galaxy like our own milky way just like a point particle but before i do that i wanted to point out that the galaxy itself is huge right it stretches so big that it takes 100000 years for light to uh, travel from one end of the galaxy to the other okay so that is the kind of scale on which you know the stars uh, about 100 billion stars are held together by gravity uh, around in you know beautiful spiral structures or you know kind of more messy elliptical galaxies and each star there even if you take the sun as a reference is about 10 to 30 kilograms so it's a massive uh, object that we are talking about when we talk about a galaxy but on the cosmological scales these are just like dust particles tracing the fluid or the air in a room so often we study the air flow by you know looking at the uh, dust particles moving around and we don't care about how the dust particles themselves look i mean there are people who care about it and there are people similarly who care about how a galaxy forms and how a galaxy is held together and their entire careers and you know generations work on that but for the kind of cosmology i'm talking about we will be just peering into the universe uh, and looking at the distribution of matter in terms of how many galaxies are there at various places so this is kind of an atlas local atlas of the distribution of galaxies in our neighborhood so we are at the center of this spherical distribution that is shown here and the cloudy structure that you see here are actually clusters of galaxies so each spot there is a galaxy itself and these spots are so densely together that they look like clouds here and this is our local neighborhood this is our neighboring big cluster called virgo cluster and then there's a coma supercluster and this is our local map if you are doing star trek and heading out of our galaxy then uh, you know this is the kind of road map you will have but this again on cosmological scales although it's a huge volume of space you can see that there's a stick here which shows you 100 million light years and that's this tiny stick at the top i'm not sure if you can see my pointer though and then this task kind of tells you yeah. the scale on which we are talking about when we talk Point about uh, point is sorry point is visible yes it is visible okay thank you so you can see that this little pointer tells you it's 100 million light years so this whole volume is huge right so it takes millions and millions hundreds of millions of years to go across this volume but this again the cosmological scale sense is our neighborhood right so if we take a map of the all the galaxies in the, that we can see and uh, plot it out it would look something like this and it this is again not not all the galaxies this is not the entire atlas of galaxies but this is typically how a region of the universe looks with lots of galaxies here and you know essentially as we move in the video you can see that you are flying through this distribution and uh, you know kind of seeing clusters of galaxies passing you by and then there are you know sort of we have tried to home into something like our own galaxy and you can see that we are part of some kind of a galactic uh, network network of galaxies everywhere and the question is you know where did this interesting rich structure in the distribution you can see that the galaxies are not uniformly distributed at all they are forming a network very interesting network of uh, you know filaments and voids uh, which sort of is very visible and apparent in this uh, you know animation and 
let me let you all appreciate this so you can see we are slowly zooming into one part of the universe but you know as you see the network goes on and on so the question is so how do we understand such a universe where there are lots of galaxies each galaxy is huge massive but you know kind of uh, they are distributed in a very interesting pattern and for that we actually invoke some symmetries in the sense we try to see if there's some simplicity in the distribution and indeed uh, we started by assuming that the distribution of matter around us is the same in every direction and this is kind of borne out by this picture coming from the 1970s which is the picture of the galaxies it's a plot of the galaxies only on the sky it doesn't show the distance away and you can see no part of the sky has you know enormously larger number of galaxies than the other there is of course some kind of graininess and coarseness but if you look at it with coarse eyes and if you have you know bad eyesight you can take care of your glasses and it's more or less uniform glow on the two hemispheres and mathematically if we assume that we are not at some special point in the universe uh, such that the universe is isotropic around us or the universe is this mass distribution is the identical around us uh, and we sort of assert that it will be this isotropic or it it will you know the same property will hold around any observer in the universe anywhere uh, then it naturally leads to a very simple model where it says that the distribution of matter is homogeneous in the universe right and that although it's a simplifying thing actually leads to one of the biggest surprises in physics because that tells you that the universe has to be expanding or mathematically it could be contracting too but we know it's expanding from observations so but it cannot be as you know it's uh, it, static universes are very rare i mean it's it's not these are not stable solutions so essentially you have a situation where you're forced to accept that space time itself expands and space expands in time right if you look at the universe evolving in time then the universe the space in the universe the three dimensional space is expanding in volume as with time and this is uh, nicely depicted here in this animation uh, and this is of course it shows a regular lattice of points not really the distribution of galaxies but the idea is that the, there's a space time fabric which is you know expanding with time right and it's taking the galaxies apart with it it's not as if the galaxies are moving in any sense okay and this expansion has very very interesting consequences itself which are very counterintuitive for example you can see here two galaxies from where there is a simultaneous burst of light i can you can see the red arrows which show you the light moving shell of light moving is slowly feeling kind of tired as it moves out okay and that is because the space time is expanding and although light travels at the same speed there is more volume to more distance to cover when it wants to get from one galaxy to the next initially it covered one galaxy to the other in some time but by the time it got to the third galaxy it finds it that the space has expanded and you know these are very interesting uh, consequences uh, and this is the basic consequence of doing cosmology it's like doing basic physics but on a membrane that is stretching or on a space uh, which is expanding in time and that is our view of our universe so if you want to ask uh, you know how much do we know about our universe or what do we know so we believe if these models are correct then our universe is expanding from some point in the past along some trajectories the size of the universe increases by some kind of pattern so it could be increasing and then contracting back 
or it could increase and co keep increasing at the same speed or it could kind of you know taper out at the end or it could expand at ever expanding ever faster speed and that we know from our model depends on how much of the matter in the universe clusters under gravitation and how much of the matter does not cluster under gravitation now we are aware that gravity is an attractive force so typically one expects that uh, you know there will be always matter if you have a uniform distribution of matter it will try to cluster together but if uh, what also the, the einstein's theory of gravitation told us is that pressure also gravitates and if we have exotic kind of matter and particularly something called vacuum energy then the pressure comes out to be negative and it cancels this attraction of matter it it actually counteracts that and you know in fact uh, there is a ever expanding universe that is expanding faster and faster with time which is shown in the red curve okay so essentially to understand our universe we needed to understand three things how much of the matter clusters under gravity how much of the matter does not cluster under gravity which i'll call vacuum energy for simplicity and what is the curvature of the universe because the universe is a smooth uh, you know it's distribution of matter which means it's a smooth space evolving in time of course the space is expanding but it's the same everywhere it's a homogeneous like a piece of paper but a piece of paper is geometrically flat but it could be the surface of a ball then it's geometrically curved and geometrically you know a uh, positive curvature space which is expanding in time similarly you can have spaces of negative curvature and that is the third unknown that we were faced with and these were totally unknown at the time even in 1990 when uh, i started my research okay but at that time we knew that cosmos has to be understood in terms of his expanding universe and that itself has interesting uh consequences one is the fact that light coming from a distant galaxy looks redder in the sense it's red shifted or it it is seen to be at uh, larger wavelengths or smaller frequencies okay and this is can be interpreted as if the object is moving just like a doppler uh effect of some source which is moving away from you is to reduce the frequency you can imagine it to be that but the right picture in cosmology is that space is expanding in time hence the galaxies are moving apart and that is what causes this red shift uh, which is kind of encoded in the hubble law the farther a galaxy uh, faster it seems to be receding from us or more is the red shift okay so red shift is a measure of distance in our galaxy and also a measure of how far back in the expansion are is the light coming from if you see the same hydrogen line but at a different frequency then we know that it originated from a galaxy at a particular red shift right uh, so in particular if it is uh, you know uh, at a wavelength uh, twice of what is normal wavelength then you think it's the, you would infer that the galaxy is at a redshift z of 1 now mind all that all that but the expanding universe itself has very very interesting consequences and i was telling you about the expanding universe to actually bring home one point so if you you know don't get all the details remember one point that a part of the universe if i'm monitoring a box in the universe which has a number of galaxies here that box increases in volume in time okay that's an expanding universe so it's the same galaxies but they are you know kind of moved apart from each other because the box itself has become bigger okay so here is the box uh, you know at some stage here it is become twice as big and again twice as big right or uh, and then if i want to 
ask the question, how does then the density of galaxies evolve in time? You can see that it's easy to see that it will be one over the box size, right? And if the box size is half the number of galaxies, uh, will be eight times larger, two to the power of cube. And then if it is one fourth the size, it times larger. Okay. But radiation has an additional thing. I told you radiation from the past uh, also changes in frequency. As the universe expands, the frequency becomes uh, lower and lower. And the energy of a photon or light is given by its frequency. So for radiation in the universe, as the universe expands, the density falls off faster, which means going back in time, okay, the density of the radiation grows faster back in time than the density of matter. So at this point, we know that the density of radiation is about one part in 10,000 of the matter density. But the, we, if we believe that the universe expanded from very small sizes to now, then there must have been a time when the universe was 10,000 times smaller than what it is now. And the density of uh, radiation was equal to the density of matter. And for any time before that, the universe was entirely dominated by radiation. Okay. And so the early universe would have been totally radiation dominated. And that makes for life very simple. I mean, you don't have to worry about if I'm talking about the universe and where it originated. I have to think of a universe full of radiation, a hot universe full of radiation. Okay. But where is that radiation now? Okay. And luckily, we have detected that radiation. And we detected it way back in 1965, uh, rather serendipitously, uh, when one of the early uh, radio telescopes uh, set up by Bell Labs was trying to, uh, you know, measure things very accurately and couldn't get rid of a noise which seemed to come from every place in the direction of the sky at all times. And this turned out to be the cosmic microwave background. This is the glow of that early radiation dominated universe. And this is the dominant radiation content of the universe. And it dominates all other radiation content. Although we have more energetic sources like X-ray, gamma ray sources, but in terms of sheer amount that these contribute to the uh, energy in the universe, the cosmic microwave background accounts for 99% of the energy density of the universe. It's also extremely isotropic, which means that our assumption that the universe is the same in every direction that we look at, okay, remarkably same, is quite well borne out. In fact, the micro background looks the same uh, to 10 parts per million. Right, so the temperature of the microwave background, which is now measured to be extremely uh, accurately to the third decimal point, is a blank distribution, it's a black body. It's, it's, it's really like a glowing hot body, okay? And it is at a temperature of three Kelvin now. But remember that when the universe is 10 times smaller than it was now, that the temperature would have been actually 10 times higher. When the universe was 100 times smaller, it would have been 100 times larger. Okay, so going back, as we go to the early universe, you know, when the universe was 10,000 times smaller, as I said, when radiation became as energetic as the matter distribution in the universe, at that time, the universe was 10,000 Kelvin, right? At that time, it doesn't matter whether you're talking in Kelvin or uh, Celsius. Right, but uh, it's about uh, you know it's it's as hot as uh, you know it's hotter than the surface of the sun. Okay, now let's try to see where are we seeing this as the cosmic micro background. So not only is this 
giving you all the radiation uh, in the universe. It's a you know it's a sample that we measure uh, when we measure cosmic microwave background. We are sampling the pristine radiation, which originated from a plasma screen when the universe was only half a million years old. The universe now is about 14 billion years old. So we are really looking at a baby universe. Okay. So if we look at a hundred year old person, this is a you know one day old baby. Okay, so this is how uh, far we can look back before the universe actually does not allow you know light to penetrate through because the universe is a hot plasma before that. Okay, so this is a plasma screen surrounding every observer in the universe, and we are lucky that we are able to see this glow through our own galaxy and the, all the emissions very clearly all the way 14, 43 billion light years away. So this is a theater. I'd like to call it like we are actually sitting in a IMAX theater where we can look all around us and we are seeing this glowing plasma screen, uh, which is 43 billion light years away. Right, and uh, it is actually at a temperature then of 3300 Kelvin. But because of the expansion of the universe, by the time we see this radiation come to us, it is at the three Kelvin temperature that we see now. Okay, so this is setting the stage for where we are seeing our signal from the cosmic micro backdrop. Also, you should remember that you can think of this screen as a physical object. It's like a shell which is surrounding us, a shell which is 43 billion light years uh, in radius around us, okay? And anything that happens on the shell is going to show up in the distribution of the light coming from this plasma screen. And for many years, this plasma screen looked very dull. It, it was the same temperature everywhere to the extent that you could measure. Till we got to early 90s when we started our research, I, when I started my research uh, with uh, the Cosmic Background Explorer, seeing the first glimpses of fluctuations on it. And that was heralded as a signature of the fluctuations that gave rise to this rich distribution of galaxy structure in our galaxy distribution. Remember, we flew through this galaxy distribution. This is the atlas I was talking about. So if I map out all the galaxies that we see here, you can see there is like a spongy kind of distribution around us of galaxies. Okay. And a typical volume of the universe, the galaxies are organized in this rich structure. And this fact that this distribution of galaxies is not, you know, dull and uniform actually is reflected in these tiny fluctuations that you see in the microwave background temperature at the level of 10 parts per million. So 10 to our minus five, right? So this is the three Kelvin uh, glow that we see. And on that, there are about tens of micro Kelvin fluctuations that you can measure in different directions in the sky. And we've been able to do that with increasing accuracy over the decades starting from 1990. Okay, and that sort of tells us how the galaxy form these intricate structures that we see now. Where where did these superclusters, clusters, and these big voids in the structure distribution of galaxies arise? They arose from these tiny inhomogeneities in the on the plasma screen when the universe was only uh, half a million years old. Okay. And uh, now it is uh, 14 billion years old. So these are really tiny perturbations in the early universe. Now that is the first part of cosmology and we have almost mapped it all out. All the information that you can get from this fluctuation here to this last scale structure here. We understand our universe very well and I'll tell you how well very soon. But the question we'll be asking is, where did the fluctuations that we are seeing in the microwave background arise at all? Where did they come from? And we believe, we believe that they came from a very early phase in the universe 
where the operating physics is at such high energies that we will never access such energies in our labs. No accelerator facility will get to such uh, energies, can even hope to get to such energies. And this is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, tens of orders of magnitude higher than what uh, we can measure in uh, our, say, the Large Hadron Collider, right? But the hope is that these, this physics actually gives rise to these fluctuations. And we'll be understanding a lot about the early physics in the universe at very high energies from this. So let me tell you what is there in the microwave background fluctuations. So what is there in the microwave background fluctuation, as I told you, is very simple physics. And that is why it makes it such a robust and uh, you know, kind of very reliable measure of what we understand of the universe. That's because the physics is very simple. It is the physics of a plasma. Plasma, you can imagine like the plasma screen to be a lake, the surface of a lake. And you know, that is disturbed and there are ripples there. So there are sound waves, right? And that is what we are seeing when we are uh, seeing the microwave background sky. So we are seeing, you know, a drop somewhere or, you know, imagine a lake, placid lake, and there's a burst of shower. Around every drop, there'll be a ring which will go out. And if I take a snapshot after 10 seconds, although the lake water will look choppy, we know that it's made up of this drop, which created a splash here, and a ripple which went out at a particular speed. In the same way, in the early universe, there were fluctuations. So the fluctuations were there everywhere at the same time. And they gave rise, each bit gave rise to a ripple. And these ripples combined to give you something that we see as the fluctuations in the microwave background. But we know underlying physics that there is a particular distance that this ripple could have traveled till the time that we, you know, the microwave background uh, screen was created, which is half a million years old. So it's speed of sound into half a million year, which gives you this. Okay. Okay. And then if we, so when you have such phenomena, you have to look at it in what is called the Fourier space or in terms of decomposition into what scales are the power in. And if you do such a thing for the micro background, it immediately sort of uh, tells you, it gives you something called a power spectrum, which is like a curve of this kind. Any of these curves that you see here is a predicted curve for the fluctuations in this micro background for different values of various parameters, like expansion rate, the total density of the universe, and total amount of ordinary matter. And, uh, and it changes a lot as I change this variable. So it stands to reason that the day we measure this well, we will be able to say a lot about the universe. So for example, we know that the ripple went out uh, and it went out uh, only with the you know ordinary matter uh, being carried with the light and hence the height of the first peak tells us the amount of ordinary matter that is there in the universe and if it is consistent with uh, our understanding of the early universe we would, would think it should be at about 70 micro kelvin similarly as I told you, I'm looking at a plasma screen 43 billion light years away. And the plasma screen actually has, you know, is decomposed into rings and the rings of particular size. Depending on what is the curvature of the universe, the, you know, you know that uh, angles in a curved universe do not add up to 180 degrees, right? So we know that this is a particular size and we know the distance to this this is the last category, you know, this is the plasma screen. This is the distance, which is 43 billion light years. And this is 150 million parsecs, right? And uh, then I can predict if the universe is like a piece of paper 
then what angle should be subtended by this scale here? And that corresponds to the location of this first peak. And if it is a flat universe, then that peak should have been at 220. OK? So over decades, in the 1990s, we had very coarse uh, mapping of the micro background. You can see that you know the resolution is poor. It got very good uh, in the next decade with another satellite called the WMAP, uh, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Pro. And uh, then it improved to what would be the ultimate uh, kind of limit on what you can measure in terms of temperature fluctuations with a satellite called Planck which uh, you know uh, operated from 2009 to 2011 but it took up to 2018 for the final results to come out and then there are future experiments which are planned all through this time when there were the satellite experiments there have been a lot of efforts from ground based uh, experiments too and i won't go into that but planck produced really the most a detailed picture of this plasma screen. So here you are seeing the plasma screen. The three kel micro Kelvin has been three Kelvin bath has been taken out, and then you see the fluctuations around it from minus three hundred to three hundred micro Kelvins in red and blue. So these are hot and cold areas of the micro background over the full sky. This is the entire sky mapped into an oval, and this is a very detailed map of this plasma screen. What is the information encoded in this plasma screen? And this is the map, which in some sense can be decomposed into dots with rings around them. The so random dots with rings of a particular size around them, right? And we discussed that. So if I am really decomposing it into that, then I can actually tell you the geometry of the universe very well. Because when I'm decomposing it, it looks like this power spectrum. And you can see the Planck measured the power spectrum very, very accurately all on all scales, stretching from you know, the entire sky, 180 degrees, to uh, uh, about uh, a tenth of a, or, or one sixth of a degree, right? So that kind of accuracy. And you can see that the measurements are very accurate because you can hardly see the error bars here. Though you know you have to subtract the red curve out of these data points to see that there are actually error bars. Okay, this is how accurate it is. And the, what I wanted to point out is, indeed, the peak turned out to be seventy-four microkelvin, and the location of the first peak turned out to be two hundred twenty, which told us that the universe was spatially flat and uh, which meant that you know one of the actors in our cosmological game is out of the picture. There is no curvature, spatial curvature in the universe. And then the game is between the amount of clustering matter and the amount of non-clustering matter, which we can figure out from the distribution of galaxies. And you can see here's a, starting from these tiny perturbations in the microwave background. If we run our simulations and ask what kind of a distribution of galaxy we'll get without clustering and you know non-clustering matter with or without vacuum energy, see that there's a marked difference uh, which we can measurably find out from our galaxy surface, and we know that this is the universe which we live in. You know the voids are much bigger in this than in this universe. So we know that we are in a universe of a particular kind, which we also can reconfirm using these remarkable measurements uh, of the micro background power spectrum. Remember that uh, Planck data points that I showed you here, they are shown in these green points here. And I can actually say that I don't know what the universe is. Let me just select six parameters. And I will keep varying the parameters. For every parameter, I can predict what the uh, cosmic micro background angular power spectrum should look like. And I can keep varying the parameters and ask what combination of parameters allows us to match this data. And this is what we actually do. 
And this is something that one of my students developed uh, amongst many things. And uh, you can see how nowadays you can, you know, kind of uh, simultaneously vary all the parameters, like dialing some knobs together so that finally I get to a combination where the black curve actually sits right on top of the data. And I can read off these values. And these are our cosmological parameters. And remember, the CIVMB physics is very simple and very well understood. So we believe these parameters. We believe that we know the baryon, uh, which is the uh, amount of ordinary matter density to 1%. We know how much of the matter is clustering, but not ordinary matter, but what is called dark matter, cold dark matter, uh, up to an accuracy of 2%. Okay, and so on. We know the expansion rate of the universe to about a percent and a half. And, you know, so it's an amazing time where the microwave background has allowed us to understand how the universe evolved from when it was half a million years old to now. Okay, that's a considerable amount of the part of the history of the universe that we already have understood. Okay, and that is consistent with a very one of the simpler models of cosmology it's uh, geometrically with spatially flat uh, spatial geometry is flat it is dominated by it's called lambda domination is domination by you know something called the cosmological constant or equivalently something like a vacuum energy and cold dark matter and you essentially need six parameters to explain all that we see in the universe uh, at this time okay so it's amazing. The story looks very simple because we have a simple model. There are only six numbers that we are playing with. Yet, uh, you know, we know that the universe we have discovered is very exotic because 95% of the universe is in some exotic form because the matter that we are made up of and we have seen our labs and you know that in the world of atoms and normal matters of electrons and quarks, that only constitutes 5% of the universe. Rest of it is made up of cold dark matter to some extent, which is about, you know, 35%. And then the rest of it is some mysterious non-clustering matter, which we call dark energy. Anything we don't understand in cosmology, we attach a dark label to it. So dark matter, dark energy, and dark energy is non-clustering. But the best explanation for that is a non-zero cosmological constant. Uh, the general relativity that, uh, you know, the theory of Einstein's gravitation allows you to have a fundamental constant called the cosmological constant. And if that is non-zero, then that also would explain this uh, energy density. Okay. But what is the next step? Remember, I hinted uh, on that when I was talking about this uh, uh, plasma screen. I said there's this plasma screen from where the whose perturbations we are measuring in the micro background, which tells us how galaxies formed into this rich structure uh, of distribution. And then we inferred all about cosmology from there. But remember, the question that remains is what perturbed that screen at all. So remember that what we have dealt with is starting from a universe which is about half a million years old with some tiny perturbations, we understand how the universe can evolve to what it is now. And that the uh, standard model of cosmology that we have now explains very well. But it still remains to be answered what gave rise to these fluctuations that we see on this cosmic IMAX theater uh, in the first place. And that answer is hidden in our understanding of the early universe at very high energies. You know, energies, as I said, far, far, far beyond the axis of any conceivable accelerator physics. Okay, and we believe that during that time, there was a phase when the universe expanded extremely fast. It's an accelerated expansion. So, it, you know, for a time it was expanding exponentially. Uh, for a short time, but it expanded by huge factors in that short time, right? A uh, factor of 10 to our 28 in 
a matter of 10 to the minus 35 seconds, say. Okay. And that violent expansion that we had actually stretched quantum fluctuations to become classical and lead to these fluctuations that we see on the cosmic screen. So it's an amazing story. Now, one would have thought, oh my God, this is again a fairy tale. But remember, we had told you a fairy tale earlier of small perturbations in the plasma screen, which would you know, grow by themselves in, by gravitational instability into giving you this distribution in galaxies that we see now. That was almost like a fairy tale itself. The, the plasma, there's a plasma screen and it's oscillating like a, you know, elastic membrane and you know, there's sound waves on it, which we are seeing as distribution of galaxy. We have verified that very well. So now we are more ambitious. We want to see if our guess about the early universe is correct. And to do that, we need to now go back and you know, call our old friend the gravitational waves. Because remember that this cosmic screen also screens out any information that you can get from the early universe in electromagnetism. Of almost every, all information that you can get there. Okay, nothing directly can come across this uh, cosmic screen. However, gravitational waves can come from right from the uh, origin of the universe or from this inflationary phase. And if our understanding of how inflation could give rise to these fluctuations in the microwave background, which has grown to become the galaxy distribution, uh, distribution galaxy and even the galaxies themselves, then the same physics tells you there would be a, a background of gravitational wave that you must exist in the universe. Only thing uncertain is how much of gravitational waves we have relative to how much of perturbations we have which relate to the galaxies. Okay, and that is encoded in a known number called R. And we are already starting to put limits on it. So at this point, R stands at about three parts, no, 3%, right? Three parts in 100. Okay. But we need to really dig further down. And it's a to do and must do for cosmology because that will nail for us our understanding of what happened in the early universe, which gave rise to the perturbations, which we have used to understand all the cosmology. It's a must do for cosmology. And of course, the entire world, there are uh, the community of cosmologists, there's a significant community of cosmologists working on that. So again, go back to the plasma screen. See, at this point, I've been talking only about the temperature fluctuations here. But there is also a net polarization fluctuation. Okay, And what happens is if there are gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe, the gravitational waves are on almost large wavelengths comparable to the size of this plasma screen. Remember, the plasma screen is 43 billion light years uh, you know, in radius, so 86 billion light years across in diameter. So they are waves, gravitational waves of that kind of wavelength. Okay, and what they do is they create, you know, allow this plasma screen to become a gravitational wave detector. Just like if you have heard the talks on LIGO, you know that, you know, on four kilometers, there are mirrors that move, you know, minuscule amounts because of gravitational waves going. What happens here is because of the existence of gravitational waves from the early universe, this plasma screen distorts to something like this, okay? And of course, it's not as exaggerated as this is hugely exaggerated, but the distortions are at the level of 10 parts per, uh, you know, 100 parts per billion, for example, okay? Or even stretching to 1,000 parts per billion. And then I would find some way of seeing whether the plasma screen has been distorted by gravitational waves from the early universe. So if you go back to this map of the sky, I have shown you a very high resolution temperature map. This is a low resolution temperature map to highlight the fact that there is also information in the linear polarization pattern. So if I look at light, you know that light has intensity 
and it can be also polarized. And cosmic micro background happens to have linear polarization. And in any direction, there's a particular stick that I can draw, which tells me the polarization of the light coming from that direction. And this creates a pattern on the sky. And to detect gravitation, and this pattern is at the level of you know a tenth of the amplitude of these uh, you know temperature fluctuations. So the temperature fluctuations are at 70 microkelvins. The polarization is a tenth of that. But we are looking for a signal that is again a factor of 10 to 100 times that, right? Uh, times smaller than that. And these are particular patterns of the stick. The patterns of the stick are have walls in them. Uh, they are not radial or tangential, but then they have this cartwheel kind of a structure. You can see that it's as if things are being twisted around like this in a vortex. And these wall patterns of vortexes in the uh, pattern are what we are looking for because they will be telltale signature of primordial gravitational waves originating in the universe. To do that, we'll have to dig very deep in sensitivity. So at this point, uh, this is the power spectrum that I showed you earlier. This is the power spectrum of one kind of polarization pattern, which is related to density perturbations, which is already measured. So at this point, our sensitivity in terms of power that we can measure at different angular scales is you know, up to this. So we have information in this cyan band. But to know about gravitational waves from inflation, I would need to dig further deep down. And I have to have experiments which have better sensitivity and cover this yellow region. And to do that, amongst many other proposals around the world, we have a proposal to the Indian Space Research Organization uh, called, uh, you know, uh, from a consortium called CMB Bharat. And the satellite mission is called ECO. It's e exploring a cosmic history and origin. And this is a multifaceted science and astronomy mission that will map all the information that is there in the microwave background sky at many, many frequencies. I won't get into why, or maybe I can answer in questions. And it will get this pattern that we are looking for. So because it will have unprecedented sensitivity, accuracy, and angular resolution. And its scientific promise is a very good chance at detecting primordial gravitational waves, which will reveal the signature of quantum gravity. But then in doing so, it will also you know, give you a lot of information about neutrinos, the dark matter in the universe, and many, many other things as uh, byproducts. But the main prized goal is the search for gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe. In order to increase the sensitivity, we need to you know, kind of uh, forge forward beyond frontiers of how small a power that we can measure. In our daily experience, we talk about a megawatt power plant and say milliwatt lasers. And you may not know this, but already your cell phone is an extremely fine detector of power. It can detect power at uh, picowatts, okay? In fact, even 10th of a picowatt. But to have detectors that can measure power at the level of attowatts. Now, this cell phone receiver uh, uh, detectors are things that were actually in the lab uh, and led to many of the, uh, you know, things in the early days of CMB, uh, many, many years back, right? In the early, uh, late 90s, what is coming out as 5G is used to be in the lab uh, there. So now in the lab, we have things which can get to this at what sensitivity. We have to have that but extremely uh, you know, delicate because they are measuring picowatts of things. So you have to put them in an environment which is extremely cold. So you have to hold this detector in a, this is basically a schematic of the satellite. And you can see 
that there's a thing which takes the microwave background and focuses it on this, you know, there's of course a lot of optics here, which is simplified. And this is the focal plane. This focal plane has to be at 100 micro Kelvin. Okay. But remember, the spacecraft is actually has solar panels here and is actually measuring, uh, you know, is, is at a temperature of 300, uh, 300 Kelvin, like room temperature on this side. So you have to have very amazing amount of thermal design to make sure you isolate this hot part of the spacecraft from this cold part. And that is done through very intricate cryogenic uh, cooling chain, uh, uh, space qualified cooling chains, which are themselves very high technology, which we need to bring up, bring in to launch such a satellite, which will keep the hot part, which is at uh, room temperature from something which is maintained at 100 millikelvins. And what is there is an array of small detectors which give you this at what sensitivity okay and you can pack together you know here in this uh, design we have 2400 detectors in this we have 7800 detectors so it depends on what we can manage but these detectors are real such detectors exist and they are being uh, put on ground-based telescopes as we speak right and these are called you know uh, transition edge sensors, uh, superconducting. These are at uh, you know basically uh, at at the uh, you know at millikelvins because of uh, the fact that you have to look at superconducting, you know, so, uh, a transition from superconducting to non-superconducting phase of a transistor, and then you pack that whole thing into a spacecraft, and you can already see the optics is more complicated than what I told you. There's the overall shield, which shields it from here. And this is the side which will face the sun always. And it will be launched away from Earth to something called the second Lagrange point. So this is the Earth moon. We will go very far away. And there is this, you know, quasi stable point where we can park ourselves and monitor the sky from there. And to get that far with a payload, which is about two tons, we need to use the best launch capability that we have at ISRO, which is our GSLV Mark III. The GSLV Mark III, if you remember, was the one which uh, took you to Mars. And this is, uh, we will have to launch it towards uh, Sun Earth orbit in L2. So I will conclude there. So you can see there's a very amazing story of cosmology that has unfolded in the last few decades and culminating in this amazing results from Planck. In fact, uh, the last year's uh, Nobel Prize to Jim Peebles uh, in 2019 was uh, actually, uh, not last year's, last, last year's now, uh, was to kind of celebrate this uh, huge advances made in understanding a standard model of cosmology, but we have to understand our origin. We have to understand the origin of the universe. And maybe the next generation cosmomicro background mission that will be launched could be uh, from India. And with that hope, let me uh, stop and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tarun, for taking us through that physics journey on a stretching membrane and also the telling the viewers about the exciting eco possibilities in the offing yeah. and there have been a number of questions actually um uh, if you would come to this window okay uh, i will stop sharing uh, them you would be able, yeah yeah you would be able okay. to see the flash the questions and i see that some of them actually you answered as you went along but maybe we'll still take the questions even sure. at that hmm? so uh all right. And so I'm starting actually at the bottom end, the last question first. And I think this was referring to the gravitational waves, right? Oh, all Can right. We should get so, <laughs> so I think where gravitational wave uh, lies in this spectrum, I think that is what he means. No, Vishwajan asks, how do we define cosmic radiation in what, what part of the spectrum does cosmic waves lie? 
हाँ 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 दे आर इन द मिलीमीटर वेव सो इट इज हायर फ्रीक्वेंसीज देन रेडियो बट लोअर फ्रीक्वेंसीज देन इंफ्रा रेड सो दिस इज वॉट इज कॉल्ड द सब मिलीमीटर बैंड So that's where millimeter and sub millimeter band is where the microwave background lies. So if you want to know in numbers, it's between say some sixty uh, gigahertz to about a um, thousand gigahertz. But uh, the most sensitive area is hundred and fifty gigahertz. Uh, then Bisuji Jana again. Uh... Gravitational waves, energy associated with it, and also. Yes, yeah, so they, exactly. So energy. gravitational waves have energy associated with them. In fact, that initially, for many decades, was a puzzle. You know, people were not sure if gravitational waves were real. But in the late fifties, uh, people got together and you know concluded that gravitational waves do carry energy and momentum. and they are just like you know light carries energy and momentum gravitational waves do that and just like light in the quantum theory is made up of photons we do expect in some quantum uh, version gravitational waves are also composed of gravitons but that quantization of uh, gravitation as you may know is still an incomplete search i uh, yeah i was actually thinking at that time in terms of the uh, the multi messenger kind of possibilities which are there and whether that was what was implied there all right so that's biswajit jana's question 1 and 2 i see ah yeah okay priya brata da i'm trying to flash this i have a little bit of problem sometimes maybe i'm flashing the wrong one but right now it has come the correct one What will happen to CMB after billions of years, Priya Prata? Same, yeah, billions of years later, the CMB will get even colder. Okay, so in uh, billions of years, you know, the universe will have expanded more. The CMB will have become colder. But also, if you're asking about the spectrum of microwave background fluctuations, they will also evolve, but on the scales of billions of years. If you want to see that, you should visit the web page of Lyman Page. One of his undergraduate students' uh, projects actually worked out the uh, CMB power spectrum that will be—I mean, fluctuation power spectrum that we measured by an observer, you know, many many billion years later. Could you spell the name? Lyman Page. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Princeton uh, faculty. Uh, uh. and uh, uh, this i think i mean you did answer this but perhaps let some more comments yeah so there okay. is no massive structure that uh, exists in the early universe so it's not as if there are black holes merging so this origin as i said is very different from the origin of gravitational waves that we are measuring with ligo or we will measure with lisa or pulsar timing there there are compact objects which are falling into each other there's motion of matter here there is actually shearing of space time uh, which is creating this gravitational waves but the shearing is coming because of quantum reasons uh, this is basically because there is a degree of freedom uh, of uh, in which space time can be shared uh, the quantum fluctuations will take that and create this gravitational waves so it doesn't require massive compact objects but uh, the energy comes from the fact that you are talking about extremely energetic uh, universe the radiation or you know th at that time was 10 to r 16 giga electron volt right energy scale so there any uh, sharing that happens generates uh, very large fluctuations uh, vivek patak uh, is asking why yes, vacuum so vacuum energy can't explain the expansion of the universe by order so that's uh, precisely why i kept talking of, uh, i in cosmology uh, community we talk about a cosmological constant because that's a constant uh, fundamental constant and you know so just like we may not ask uh, 
so much as to why the gravitational Newton's constant is whatever it is. Similarly, the cosmological constants happen to be small. Yes, if I want to interpret it as vacuum energy, then it's a problem because there has to be, we know that vacuum energy is real and, uh, you know, quantum fields do have uh, vacuum energy, but we believe that they can be, you know, understood to be kind of zero, but that is a problem when you have gravitation involved because, uh, you know, when we set that to zero in the absence of gravity, that is fine, but in the presence of gravity, it poses a problem. But if you want to look at vacuum energy as a, a, you know, kind of the zero point energy, it is given by the scale of the physics you're looking at. And, you know, even if we think of scales of TeV, then we miss the energy density by a huge amount, by these 130 orders of magnitude. So vacuum energy is not really uh, easy to explain, use to explain the cosmological constant that we measure. Uh, Vivek Pathak asked something, and then I think Vishwajit Jana was partially referring to that and has his own question. So maybe I will flash both. This is Vivek okay. Pathak. Yeah, so uh, we, can we distinguish whether a galaxy lies on this ripple? Yes, so uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, we do measure uh, you know, this uh, ripple in the distribution of galaxies. Now, it's not as if there's a cluster lying on the ripple, but basically what happens is this is there everywhere, right? So I told you there is there are raindrops falling everywhere and there's a ripple around it. But now if you choose one of the places where there's a maximum density, then around that, the density will keep falling off and then at about 150 megaparsec, you see a little excess of galaxies. And so that is true. In that sense, relative to a location of a cluster, you will see that. So Vishwajit Jana, he was responding through that a little, and then he has this question. Yeah, when we detect a gravity wave, a gravitational waves, it detect only. Here we are not even seeing uh, the wave in action because uh, wavelength is uh, on cosmological scales. You know, some I told you, like wavelengths of uh, forty-three billion light years. And now, if we uh, imagine their time period, then we will have to wait billions of years for the wave to. So we still see a static image of the gravitational waves. So it's not as if there's a wave passing by. It's, uh, you know, the time period is so large that we it's, it's like frozen for us. OK, now I think there are also some questions from uh, there, are, there are school as well as college students uh, in the group who are there. Uh, this probably is. A common question which does arise to someone encountering these topics for yeah. the first time. So there is no center to the expansion of the universe. The universe is expanding everywhere. Okay, so it's not actually. I somehow sometimes uh, find that you know when we have these BBC serials, they kind of show you a hot ball expanding out. That's not what is happening. The universe is actually expanding everywhere around every point. So there's no center to the expansion of the universe. Yes. Uh, Kiran Mehta had this question. Uh, size of the universe. Yeah, so this is size of the universe in the sense that you're saying the distance to the plasma screen is 43 billion light years. Uh, why is it not 14 billion light years? Because that will be speed of light into uh, 14 billion years. That's because of the expanding universe. You remember that light travels more in the early times because distances are smaller. And but uh, later the universe has expanded. So what light covered in this first uh, bit actually accounts for a lot. And if you take an expanding universe, you can show that there is this factor. 
depending on the expansion history of the universe in the, our standard universe, there's a factor of about 1.7 uh, which comes in here. Kiran Mehta also had this question and uh, I was texting him that saying that perhaps these asymmetries, etc. It's a much larger scale that I... Yeah, so why do we use homogeneity mathematically, although we have... Yes, but uh, the, we also know that the inhomogeneity dies out as you look at average on bigger and bigger scales. Although we see clusters and superclusters of galaxies, I told you, those are on, you know, on, on the neighborhood scale. But if you are kind of averaging the universe on sizes of 200, uh, you know, million light years or few hundred million light years, then you will find that the universe, even the distribution of galaxies on the average, very smooth. But the strongest reason for homogeneity comes from the fact that the cosmic radiation, uh, the dominant radiation form in the universe, which is in the cosmic background, itself is extremely homogeneous. Uh, OK, uh, since I was putting his questions, let me just put uh, one more too. Uh, the inflation of mass of the entire universe caused the gravitational waves. That's also from Kiran Mehta. Oh, no, actually, it's, uh, it's not easy to imagine this in terms of masses. And it's more to do with, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, quantization of uh, degrees of freedom in uh, space time. So I wouldn't want to imagine that you are thinking of, you know, something sloshing around. Uh, related to that, Sahir Auja also is asking this. Uh, he has two questions, which I think it related. He just wants to, after this, he also wanted to you, ex, you to explain the, the cosmic gravitational wave detector. Yeah, so cosmic background from inflation, as I said, is of quantum origin. And we believe the physics that gave rise to fluctuations, that gave rise to density perturbations, which gave rise to the distribution of galaxies we see, uh, also creates gravitational waves. Okay, and this, this actually is again a random noise kind of uh, background, and hence it's called the gravitative background, and it originates from inflation. It doesn't cannot be thought of, uh, you know, decomposed in terms of masses oscillating and things like that. It's, it's not easy to think of it like that. It's not prob probably also correct to think of it like that. Now, what is the cosmic gravitational wave detector? It's like I told you there is a, you know, actually we see that there is a plasma screen surrounding us at 43 billion light years. So it's like, imagine you are sitting in IMAX theater and there's an earthquake. The, you know, theater is going to oscillate, right? And, you know, some part of this, so you will see that distortion to the images there. Similarly, if the universe had uh, gravitational waves from its beginning, then they, they kind of rock the uh, plasma detector, right? Rock in the sense you don't see it shaking, but you see it distorted because the distortion is going to change only on the scales of billions of years. Uh, Astro Explorer wants you to give information oh, about the experimental the science. <laughs> okay, so the LIGO India has two aspects to it. One is the construction of the facility, which is going well. And there is also a training and R&D program, which is spread across about a uh, dozen institutes in the country where there are researchers working on cutting edge uh, aspects of gravitational wave experiments. Yes, I thought you would need no, no whole talk for this, because many of the questions might be like that. And yeah, she is asking Priya Brata, um, whether this I think you touched upon a little. Yes, we, we need to. Uh, we, at this point, predict these gravitational waves based on an approximation to quantum gravity called quantum field theory in curved space time. And if this is borne out, then we know at least our approach to the theory of quantum gravity 
is correct. Okay, we don't have a radical problem there. Okay, uh, in some cases, actually, the participants have been answering each other's questions, but I mean, I, I thought maybe you may still want to co comment on it. Uh, this is whether this was answered correctly, you want to comment on it? Uh, it's correct, yeah, the micro background is. So, no, no, no. Yeah. Yes, so we, we do have very uh, enthusiastic participants who keep answering each other's questions. Yeah, that's very nice. That's very nice. <laughs> that makes it easier. <laughs> okay, I think if there are any other questions, you please post, or if I miss something from above, please post it again. Uh, okay, Astro Explorer has this question. Uh, massive objects cause dip in space time fabric, then why we are seeing stars in northern sky? All stars are heavier. No, no, so it's not as if the dip is, uh, you know, so you have to imagine the dip is in a, a space that is three dimensional. You're imagining the earth floating on some surface which is and dipping it. That's not what is happening. Yes. So uh, I think I have picked up. There were earlier there were a couple of comments like thing. They are not questions, so I am not picking those up. But if I missed any question above, please type it again before we will be ending the broadcast. If any question has been missed, and uh, uh, Tarun, thank you for answering so patient. Uh -huh. We have a mix of uh, participants, no school as well as college. No, that's so we, good. That's we nice. have a wide right. spectrum of questions also. Yeah, I, you know, I, I know it's a fairly technical area, but uh, you know, I just wanted to convey the excitement uh, of what's happening in cosmology. Uh, cosmology and particularly for young people, they would be the, you know, people uh, acting age when uh, you know this will happen. You were saying that if there's uh, there are questions, you would uh, um, tell us a little more about the different frequencies for detection in echo. Oh yeah, that is because uh, we have to peer at the micro background through the emissions in our own galaxy. And that uh, we kind of uh, clear clean out because that galactic emission depends differently on frequency than the micro background. And we can clean it out by using measurements of the microwave sky at different frequencies. So we have many, many frequencies and that allows us to clean this better. Uh... I think there was one more, sir. Just if you, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. This was more of a general thing that uh, Vishwadi Jana wants to know what would be the possible opportunities for undergraduate BTEC students. Also, there is this uh, the, the, the LIGO uh, educator program. Yeah, so that. there's the LIGO like, underscore outreach. And mm -hmm. you can reach out there. Uh, there is, in fact, also a website. Uh, uh, link where uh, you can uh, post your CVs and we look for project students there uh, with engineering background. So first of all, let me tell you, I am myself an engineer, so you can, can change into physics and work in uh, uh, but as an engineer, you have also a lot of roles. So you can see uh, in LIGO India itself, there are uh, various aspects of engineering uh, that is important and will keep becoming, uh, will stay important all through. Even after we have built the detector, as we improve it, we'll need more of mechanicals, uh, you know, control systems, uh, electronics, uh, all, all branches. Uh, similar case with CMB Bharat, the eco thing, it is actually very high end. Uh, electronics and uh, thermal uh, modeling, uh, as well as, uh, you know, there is a lot of control theory there too. Viswajit uh, um, Jana was asking for your contact, etc. But I just wanted to ask you this. 
that hmm. um, uh, would it be possible because many of the the, the students here do have some uh, they have been trying to do a little bit of quantitative follow up after the talk hmm. is there any project which they could take up uh, with maybe some coding skills uh, there are projects hmm. but you know we are getting a lot of requests so what we have is a portal i will see if i can quickly post that on the chat mm. will that show up there no right uh yeah if you post it in the chat it will show up i don't know whether it uh, stops links but let's try that if we can put that out else uh, also i think biswajiti you are there in astro adda group right so we can post it there and um sometimes yeah. so i'm going to ask teachers if they would join this whatsapp group for students the, this data. is what i typically send out so there is a gravity wave research opportunities um, yes that know, has link. come to me in private chat let me try to put it out in uh, general chat and uh, so before we end the broadcast so that this would go uh yeah it has gone into the chat so yeah the the opportunities which you are suggesting are possible for undergraduate students so uh, uh, you know so we actually have a kind of a uh window where we collect these and then you know then try to put them into various projects that we have hmm. but i must tell you that we get lots of requests and uh, at this point our community is not big enough to support as many people but we will slowly become bigger and bigger and we'll do that bisujit uh, uh, tarun's contact would be on the website of iser and also perhaps on yeah, yeah you sure can, i yeah, mean people yeah. are welcome to write to me yeah, yeah yes, yes. please uh, email me and i can so uh thanks so much tarun for okay uh, no, thank you it's a pleasure this this, uh, this complex uh, field for giving a kind of a user friendly field to all the there are okay. more one or two i think have come in is it okay is this yeah sure like that ah uh is there any prospect of seeing uh... yeah gravitational lensing is seen in the micro background it's actually one of the things measured by plan and uh, in fact uh, one of my former students uh, uh, you may have seen him in ayuka Shubhati is even also working on, uh, you know, the effect of gravitational waves uh, to be seen in the micro background, uh, and uh, there are exciting things that are possible. Yes, but yes, gravitational waves themselves lens, and uh, cosmic micro background also is gravitationally lens. Okay, so there is a general question by a student who is in, seems to be interested in research, but the parents would not not facilitating it. These issues do come up uh, for many young people. These issues are there, and uh, perhaps parents uh, think about what may be the later on career issues and so on. The thing is that what you are interested in, in some case, I mean, try to pursue it in whatever way, whatever opportunities. which now if there are many people who are not getting opportunities maybe because they have not crossed the uh, the undergraduate postgraduate appropriately but they are still interested in research so look for uh, possibilities with which you are able to just stay true to your interest while at the same time i guess i mean you would have to um, follow your uh, parents advice and so on. okay so i think um, we will close this session here there are no other questions which have come in thank you okay. so much tarun thank you and thank you all of you yeah so i'll end the broadcast here now i don't see any questions